Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just so happy to see you because, and I must uh, say thank you for coming to this wonderful CI concert in this snowy night. Of course, you know this is going to be a wonderful program, so it's worth your while to come, but still thank you very much. Now, uh, I'll be very short and I'll just make some announcements. First, because of you, we have been a very successful, so we just won a CI of the Year Award last December. So I think that's a goal, uh, something we are very proud of. <laughs> and it is because of your support, that's why our programs are good, have been good, and the uh, Chinese uh, Hanban office acknowledged us. So thank you very much again. Now, I know uh, some of you are good friends and dedicated audience of the CIUM, and thank you again. But some of you may not be, so I want to tell you that we have a raffle going on. So we have prepared a list, uh, quite a bit of uh, gifts, CI t-shirts, CI mementos, uh, souvenirs. So for you to get that, you have to go out up in, the, in the mission or at the end of the concert to sign up at the raffle. So by signing down your email address. So we will do a raffle the, later on Sunday, and the announcements will be made, sent to you by email. So make sure you put your email down at our con, uh, contact list. So now let me uh, say, uh, tell you two more exciting programs that is going to come. Uh, at the end of this month, on February 22nd, we are inviting a well, uh, internationally renowned Chinese uh, baritone singer to come to give a concert of favorite songs. All the Chinese songs you want to hear will be sung in that concert right here in this uh, uh, Rackham Auditorium. So it's February 22nd. So mark that and save the day for that wonderful concert. And then a month after that, we will have another exciting concert by uh, Fusion of uh, Chinese and world music. So that will be by the Orchid Ensemble. So that would also be a fascinating concert too. So, uh, so you see that we are having all these exciting programs. And in addition, we have a lot of uh, wonderful lectures, noon lectures, distinguished lectures on Fridays. So please check our website. Uh, and which I think is www.confucius.umich.edu. Uh, so please check our website and you'll get our latest information. And also there you'll find lots of beautiful pictures, uh, reading materials about Chinese arts and culture. So please uh, visit our website too. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, our artists for tonight. They are Mei Han and Randy Rain Roche. They are absolutely fantastic musicians, and what makes them particularly fantastic is they are very traditional. They really know the traditional uh, preparatory performance styles and aesthetics really well. But at the same time, they are very modern, just like CI is, very traditional and very modern. So they will perform tonight a wonderful concert, mostly of traditional Gujang Zither pieces, but then with a mix of some world music and even a little bit of Japanese instrument there. And we are Asian, so we welcome that too. So, uh, but that is a very fascinating instrument. You don't get a chance to listen to it performed often. So without further ado, let's welcome Mei Han and Randy Rain Roof. So first of all, 春节快乐, 马到成功. 恭喜发财, 恭喜发财.
next piece I'm going to play is called uh, uh, Three Variations on the Theme of Plum Blossom. And plum Blossom is a significant um, flower in Chinese culture. It symbolize, symbolizes uh, many good virtues. In the ancient time, scholars would uh, paint a uh, flower, paint a uh, plum blossom in the winter time, and usually it's very small flower on the big old tree trunk. So that means the endurance, the nobility, and also to me, that tree trunk means roots. So when I play music, I always try to feel what the ancient musicians or scholars would feel like. So this is my interpretation of Mei Hua San Nong.
Thank you very much. Randy, can you talk a little bit? I need to read this. Um, it's very nice to be up here. We were in uh, Ann Arbor, I guess, around 10 years ago. Um, we came up to uh, do, actually, May was um, helping uh, with some graduate courses. Um, actually, we're artists in residence, I guess, as most people say it's artists in residue, I think is more appropriate. Um, so actually, there is some residue of us here. Uh, one of the instruments that we help someone buy is still here, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, we also helped with the Stearns, uh, sort of consulted a little bit for the Stearns collection. Really wonderful collection of musical instruments that University of Michigan uh, is, I guess, very proud to own. Some really quite wonderful instruments. And in those, the treasures of Stearns, you'll find some instruments such as what we're playing tonight and many, many more. I think most of you probably know about this instrument because there is a 
Confucius Institute here. So lots of Chinese culture in Ann Arbor, and also you have a great ensemble, you have great teachers uh, from China, from Central Conservatory. And this is called the Zheng, and known, also known as Gu Zheng. Gu Zheng is a contemporary name and given to this instrument in the 20th century. And I usually don't want to call it Gu Zheng because uh, it already has a name. Now, people call me Han Mei, or Mei Han is good, but it's call me, if they are calling me Lao Han Mei, you know, I'm not that very happy. So, um, Probably one thing you don't know yet, this is the most popular Chinese instrument right now with an estimated 20 million practitioners around the world. Uh, professionals, the amateurs, and children, adults. However, in the ancient time, especially uh, in, say, before 20th century, this instrument was considered a folk instrument, which is really inaccurate. And during that time, the, the hierarchy in Chinese culture, which you probably could sense a lot, um, for instance, the Qin, the piece I played, uh, the Mei Hua San Nong, that came from Qin repertoire. Qin was written down, unbroken record for thousands of years, and Zheng was handed down orally from generation to generation. However, the Zheng repertoire actually is, was very traditional repertoire, was very rich. The next piece I'm going to play is from Chaozhou, uh, from southern China, from Guangdong province. And Chaozhou music is very famous for its left hand uh, bending technique. And if you are speaking Chinese, you know right now we call, uh, in Chinese, which is sheng yin is sound, yeah, two words. But in ancient time, sheng and yin have two separate meanings. Sheng is, this is a sheng. You make a sound, that's a sheng. However, you, if you want to make music, you have to craft the sound to make it into music. So what the left hand on the Zheng traditional repertoire is mostly to craft notes to change sound into music. This is or Pink Lotus in many modes. If you're not familiar with music uh, terms, what is mode, it doesn't matter. Um, modes is uh, the tonal center that changes in the scale. Uh, what you can sense is in this piece is that the feeling starts from some kind of a dark feeling and it's transforming into a bright sense of feeling. Or in Chinese, I would say, um, uh, uh, so you
I got tired just listening to how fast she went. So this is a piece that uh, many of you might know, um, but we're not going to play it the, the normal way uh, because we don't do things normally. Um, we really love traditional music and we study traditional music uh, from a number of traditions. May, of course, um, most of the Chinese tradition, myself, many other traditions as well. Um, and we certainly take inspiration for all our contemporary pieces from traditional music. Um, this is a, this is a uh, composition that was written when was 1950, um, and we've taken some liberty uh, with it. So we uh, would like to offer our sincere apologies to the composer of this piece. Um, it was a uh, a piece written uh, as uh, a, a kind of a political piece during the the Chinese Revolution. The, the, how would you explain that? What's uh, well, it's Yao Zu Wuqu. In fact, uh, um, according to the uh, program notes, this is, depicts the happy feeling of Yao people from southwestern China. Very, very political message there. No, I wouldn't <laughs> say that. People are just happy in China. <laughs> so we, we made it a little bit happier. <laughs>
This instrument is known as a can. Um, can is from northeastern Thailand. They come in a number of different sizes. Can hook, which has six pipes, which is about that long. Uh, considered a, a children's instrument, although I've played quite a few large pieces on a children's instrument. Uh, can gao. Can gao is about this tall. Um, I had one which I sold to the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it, uh, it's a beautiful instrument, 18 pipes. Um, it, uh, actually, mine was kind of short. They made them very large. Um, it was hard to play, though. Um, in fact, they made them so large that there was a, a rumor of one time the king was coming to the northeast where the, the can comes from in, in Thailand. And so they made a temple. And they asked a can player to make a special can gao, where they made all the reeds uh, with ivory and jewels and everything like this. And they made this beautiful big temple. And the can gao player got there, and the temple ceiling was too small for the instrument. It was too low. So they actually, very unceremoniously, cut a big hole in the ceiling so he could stick the, stick the top of the instrument through the hole. Um, things are a bit different in Thailand than other places. Um, uh, also, what was really kind of interesting is that they stopped playing can go. Um, they started playing this, which is known as a, a can pot. Um, they stopped playing can go mainly because it was too big to carry on a motorcycle. And that's literally the reason why they stopped playing. It's just too big. You know, you're driving along in your motorbike, you got it like this, and you lop off somebody else's head. Um, so this is an instrument that I've been playing for many, many years. I was fortunate to study with two of the um, top players uh, in Thailand. One of them is now passed. The other now is, is really quite famous, uh, named Sombat Sin La. Uh, and my other teacher is Nukan Shri Chang Tin. So this is a contemporary piece again on Kango, or Kampak.
Thank you. Many years ago, I had heard of this new Jung player in town who showed up at UBC. Which is Vancouver, Canada. Which is Vancouver, Canada. That's where I was living. And uh, I got tired of Jung players. I mean, Jung players are a dime a dozen, right? There's lots of them, everybody, everywhere. I had wanted to play contemporary music. I had had been playing Jung for about 15 years. I had uh, taken some traditional studies, got tired of it, retuned my instrument, did some crazy music, and every time a Jung player came to town, I anxiously got in touch with them, usually women, and uh, you know, showed them what I was doing, and they thought it was weird, and that was the end of it. So I wasn't interested in this new Jung player. She was there for about a year, and then we met at an ethnomusicology conference. She said hi, I said hi. Uh, we were polite to each other. And um, a little while later, she called me up and said, you know, um, I, I want to play some music. And I said, well, that's good. I'm not really interested in playing any traditional Chinese music. She said, well, I'd, at least let me hear what you're doing on the Jung. I hear you're doing in innovative stuff on it. I said, sure, come on over. So um, she came over and I had put on a CD I had just recorded of contemporary jazz. And it's not even contemporary jazz, it was experimental jazz. It was really noisy, really hard listening music uh, known as free improv. Most people um, don't like it. Um, you know, people who are, who are consider themselves fairly elitist with uh, music and very sophisticated, they don't, they don't like this stuff. And so then I, I put that on intentionally to chase her away. So, you know, she came over, we had tea, then I put on the CD, and she sat down to listen to it. And she listened far longer than I expected. I thought, wow, she's very polite. Um, and then she looked up and said, this is the most amazing junk playing I've ever heard. And at that point, I realized I had somebody very, very special in the room. And uh, consequently, we very quickly, uh, you know, I, I, she was very beautiful. So I said, well, why don't you come downstairs and let me show you my tunings? Um, good line, I thought. Um, but went downstairs to my studio where I had my jung in a very contemporary tuning. And I said, why don't you try it? And it didn't make any sense to her. The tunings were just nothing like she was used to playing. So um, I said, well, you obviously You've been playing for many years. You know where a piece is, is by the position of your hands. She says, yeah, of course. I said, okay, close your eyes, put your hands on the strings, play in the position like you're playing a traditional piece, just ignore what the sounds are coming out. And so she played for about a good, good 10 minutes and uh, just improvising. And she just looked up and said, I feel free. So first time she's ever improvised was at that moment. Um, so we started playing together. We started playing music together. We're gonna, the, two, or the three pieces we're gonna play for you now are pieces that we created uh, from that moment. And uh, it was kind of funny because at a certain point after f many four hour long telephone conversations, I realized something else was going on. But that's another story. <laughs> But probably by now you all figured out that she is me. <laughs> so this is our composition, Distant Wind.
So you may wonder um, why we call this concert uh, Dao to Now. And in our music, uh, we feel um, there's a lot of influence of Taoism. Yeah, Taoism is one of the uh, uh, school of thoughts in, created in ancient China, and it has become foundation for Chinese music, especially for uh, scholar music and uh, music for self-cultivation. And one of the things that I feel is that uh, when making music, we need to connect with a bigger nature, uh, not just the society, not just the between people, it's people and nature. People is part of nature. And this is why in our music, we uh, uh, dedicated titles such as the two pieces which is played, Distant Wind, uh, Forest Ring, it always have something to do with nature. And the next piece uh, is called Tokyo Crows. In 2001, Randy uh, and took me to Tokyo to study Japanese koto. And early in the morning, uh, I was awakened up by the sound of crows, really loud. I was wondering, you know, during the daytime, I never noticed that there was any sound of bird. And I realized, you know, in the modern city, especially Tokyo, so many people and so many sounds are going on. So totally drowned out the sound of birds. So and we dedicated this piece to Tokyo's crows. The instrument Randy is tuning is called Ichigenkin. Ichi is one, gen is string, kin is instrument. Um, this is um, considered the most Zen instrument. Is that correct, Randy? Um, it's not the most Zen instrument. No, okay. It's one of the most Zen instruments. Yeah, um, so if we're really Zen, we shouldn't have any instrument. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. Um, the shakuhachi, the bamboo flute, is considered very zen because it's just a hollow tooth. Uh, this is considered very zen because it only has one string. So the reason why they think it's very zen, after you play the one string, zen what? Um, uh, with one string, with this instrument, there is no body. It's just a plank with a string on it. Um, and the string... It, you, you can't hide behind it. There's nothing to hide behind. There's no extraneous noise. There's no, nothing to hide behind. So this just shows who you are, what you are. And because of that, it's an extremely difficult instrument to play. So Ichi Genkin, Tokyo Crows.
Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, the last piece of this concert. I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Joseph Lam, who invited us here, and to thank the Institute, and thank you for coming out in this, uh, um, on this snowy day. I don't know if it's still snowing outside, but you know this is the first uh, uh, winter we live in uh, Midwest, uh, the weather has not been nice to us, <laughs> West Coasterners. We're, we're used to rain all winter. We're, we're, our weather is just like Seattle, so this is very shocking to us. And I think I've developed an, an allergy. Oh, thank you. I think I've developed an allergy because every time I step outside these days, my hands start to shake, and I think it's, I don't know what it is. Not used to that in, in, uh, in scenic, rainy Vancouver. To continue the story that Randy was telling about uh, uh, him teaching me, then you know, four hours conversation on the phone, then finally, you know, man and woman get together, and we decided to get married. And Randy is pretty uh, superstitious as a Lao Wai, um, a foreigner. Wait and a second! I thought Chinese were superstitious. <laughs> Wow, now in this case, you're the Chinese then. I'm not so allowed to he, say the number four ever in the house. Uh, yeah, then uh, he looked up almost every book he could find about uh, Chinese... Uh, um, Astrology. So, so, so... Zodiac. Zodiac. The Zodiac. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I'm a dog. Dog is a wonderful creature. Who doesn't like dog? Very loyal. Yeah, and he's a dragon. Oops. Dragon uh. is aloof. It's hard to uh, deal with. And on every book, it says, never marry a dragon. This is for dog. The only two signs in the Chinese zodiac that should never, ever be together are the dragon and the dog. Every other combination is fine, just not the dragon and the dog. That's right. One book, in fact, said, it is like two volcanoes waiting to happen. Exactly. So instead of happening in the kitchen, let's happen here. 
So we, did, we created this piece of music to channel that dragon dog energy into it, and that's the name of this piece, Dragon Dogs. 